Okay, when you're ready. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. That's probably low okay. Om Drisham Pratitam Pravila Payam San, San Matram Anandaganam Vibhavayam, Samahitas Va Antaram Va, Kalam Yetaha Sati Karma Bande, Om Shantihi Shantihi Shantihi. Brahman is an indeterminable mass of pure conscious awareness. Therefore, taking what is outside, and what is inside. Render them into one indivisible state. Then meditate upon that state. Pass your time contentedly. Destroy your karmas and be free. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Brahmanandam Parmasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurtim Dandwaiti Tam Gagana Sadrisham Tatvama Shadi Laksham Ekam Nicham Mimala Machalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Triguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Om Shantihi 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 We salute the leader of our souls through whose grace our karmas are destroyed, who is, behind, who is beyond good and bad, pleasure and pain, life and death, and all other pairs of opposites. We recognize that one is the only witness to the changing phenomena of this universe. May we, through that grace, go beyond darkness and delusion and realize the truth in this very life. Om peace. Peace, peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Obunaktu, Sahavir Yam Karabhavahai, Tejasvi Navadita Mastu, Ma Vidveshavahai, Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us, may Brahman sustain us, and may Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings, and may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. Namaste to everyone who has arrived here at the center in Waimea, our SRV Associations, Hawaii. And we are launching into a three series class <coughs> on karma, neutralizing karma and samskaras. Those two words, if you're new to the Vedanta or to Indian philosophy, can be easily defined for you as we move into this class, this first class. But basically karma is cause and effect and samskara is 
an impression left on the mind by doing things over and over again. And those impressions are really responsible for the way we act and the way we think and how many times we take on a body and how we live, how we pass away out from the body and how we return. So many things rely upon these samskaras and these samskaras have been, and that word in Sanskrit has been in the Indian dictionary as it were, whether it's been written down or not, from time immemorial. It's, uh, they accept karma and reincarnation fully as the fact of the matter. They accept it over the problem of, say, what we're faced with here, the grace of God as a savior, or on the other hand, I'm a sinner. So either of those positions are not tenable for the Vedantist or the yogi. They're thinking more in terms of um, um, you reap what you sow, and so you had better sow good seeds. And that would, that would uh, <coughs> approach the doctrine of karma. But the samskaras are sort of further proof of the cause and effect of things in our world. Samskaras uh, are canyon walls. Sometimes we, we, I've been describing the call out, you see, and it echoes back to you what you say. So that's cause and effect, really. Um, so we've also been using that in terms of of uh, the West. The Western culture doesn't have any canyon walls. They call out, and <laughs> nothing comes back. You see, <laughs> what's? Why am I here? Who am I? <laughs> nothing comes back because you have to build these some scars over time. You have to study philosophy practice religion, practice being the key word called sadhana, you must actually exert or, or, or be a participant in your spiritual life, it has to go beyond mere prayer at meals and once attending centers once a week or so. It has to really, you have to really participate day to day in your, in really what's the celebration of your own eternal enlightenment. <laughs> if you're really living life to the fullest and, and you have a 100% view all-round view of everything, universal mind we call it, then uh, you are living in Brahman. There's no doubt about that. And, but it can't be feigned or faked. It can't be just a search for pleasure and success, as we know, because that has failure and pain as the opposite. It's, it's not in the realm of dualities, but karma definitely is in the realm of dualities. So that's why we call that relative law karma and samskaras, reincarnation, a relative laws, the, the eternal law or the indivisible laws that thou art that and you can't take that away at all. You are that, uh, as the Tantra say, you are the darling of your own worship or you know, if you're bowing before the shrine you, you must realize Gauna Bhakti is the first stage of that worship and that's where you create an external symbol because somewhere inside you haven't got it straight, you see. Or maybe you've forgotten that all of this needs to be reverenced, at least respected. You see, maybe nature has gotten away from you. You see, and you, you're just using it as a multi-corporate national corporation would do, or something. It's no, mm. no uh, um, conscience at all, as it were, and no regard for the law of karma that's in nature. And if that's the case, then you know you, you've. you've destroyed any canyon wall, anything, any coming back on you. It'll come back unexpected in, in the most unusual way, un, unwanted way, undesirable way. So you, you uh, will have to uh, engage in self-effort in order, day to day, in order to celebrate your own enlightenment, you see. And until, if that's non apparent to you, if your own enlightenment is, isn't an everyday affair, then that practice keeps you on the cutting edge of things and neutralizes your day to day cause and effect. And that's an ideal practice when, you know, Sri, uh, Swami Vivekananda used to say, those who are more advanced, their karma comes back to them quicker. The quicker your karma comes back at you from anything you do, the more advanced you are spiritually. And so, Let's look at the opposite end of that statement. If it does takes a long time to come back, because everything comes back in cycles, like Buddha said, everything returns, 
that that includes everything from you know uh, the Mahat, the great mind on down through the whole spectrum. Uh, everything returns. So if it's taking longer to come around, then uh, you're living in a bubble. You know, the more chance you are of living in a fantasy and it's try thinking that you've escaped your karma when it's really gathering momentum and coming back full force at you. And this is instanced in some, some of the happenings in people's lives that they're not ready for. Like uh, called the uh, electric company the other day after our windstorm here. Mm -hmm. We had another storm, another big blow here. And they said, said well, when, do you give us any idea when the electricity might go on? Well, we just asked people to be prepared. Well, that's all she said. We just asked people to be prepared for any eventuality. So that's what you have to do. <clears throat> if you're not prepared for that big blow of karma that's coming your way, uh, death, disease, uh, old age, which is mar on the march, as Sri Ram says. We sang, sang his names last night in our sacred arts event at the New Thought Center in Kona, in a big concert we just gave. So you, you have to be prepared for those things, and prepared for them means meditating on them. Vivekananda used to say, meditation on death. And you may have been taught it's a, it's a morbid thing in the West. Your parents told you, don't think about it. You just live. But uh, no, it's not that you want to shirk uh, uh, the idea of death uh, or obsess with it. You see, that's a duality, a karma that you're going to get caught in. It's going to form a samskara in your mind of brooding. Fear, death, doubt, those things are the four great traps they're called in Vedanta. But what you want to do is take a practical approach to things. You want to stare death in the face, yama. Read the Kato Upanishad. The Kato Upanishad has Nachiketas, the young boy, having to go look for death because his father, in a moment of anger, cursed him. So I'm going to give you to death. And so sort of like saying, go to hell in modern times. But Yama took him literally and said, oh, well, then I belong to death. I better go find him. I better go ask him what's beyond you. Because he didn't believe death was the end. So. Uh, that's an atheist or possibly an agnostic person who thinks like that. But Yama is a deeper thinker. He says, I exist. How can I never not exist? All of this exists. How can it not exist? I see it coming back in cycles. Now the only question is, can I get off the cycle? Uh, that's a very rare thought. That's a Buddha thought. He, he was thinking in terms of getting off cycles. Cycles means cycles of birth and death, cycles of having to come back with your ancestors, which, if you think about it, is all this problem you had growing up with your siblings, with your brothers, with your nephews, with your uncles, with your aunts, with your grandmother, with your grandfather. You think back, oh, aren't they nice? No, it wasn't so nice. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things that were not so nice about growing up in the West. And, and I've been to the East and I've seen the conditions there in families. It's also always not all that nice. So, it, and it leads to worse. It's called exacerbated karma. See. So uh, Vivekananda said, uh, "Piles more gloom on gloom," is the line that he uses in his poem "Song of the Sanyas," which I think I sent to you in a recent email. <coughs> so all of this being kind of a preamble to this fact that we must participate in an ongoing sadhana in order to annul that day-to-day -day karma. We're going to have a retreat next week and called here in Hawaii called making crucial spiritual connections. And we've already talked about the role of prana in that life force, how you have to get control of your own life force. And, and this is a good uh, precursor to that too. Karma and samskaras are, you have to make connections with that. So when you meditate on death, for instance, as we were just saying, then you're going to have to see through it. You're going to have to prove it to be an illusion. Um, and it's a deity too. Death is, is a great god. See, karma is a great god. And there's a beautiful song in India that says, you know, Yama and Karma and Kama. They all went looking for this man who died, but they couldn't find him. Who's that man that died that Yama, Karma, and Kama couldn't find? Yama is the god of death, Karma is the god of cause and effect, and Kama is the god of desire. 
they all went looking for this man and they couldn't find him. Who is that? You see, I want to know that man who escaped those gods. So these are deities inside of you because millions and billions of people experience them and they also worship them. They worship death. Don't they think about it all the time? The god of pleasure is a god. Everyone's worshiping that god. See, So these become entities inside of you, at least call them energies, and they form complexes, and people by the millions concentrate on them, think about them every day, and they give them power. See? So they are giving away your power to this and that deity, basically. Let's, uh, let's pick, say, what we do here in this center. How about, let's replace all those with Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. <laughs> let's make him the chosen deity and spend all our time thinking upon him. Let's see what that does to a lifetime. Myself, over 40 years, and our founder, Lex in over 50 years. My teacher, Swami Sheshananda, over 90 years of concentrating on Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. So what would that do to a lifetime, you see, to a soul? How would that transform a mind? So we replace all of those, and then we understand the difference between an eternal law and a relative law. Karma and samskaras, reincarnation, being relative laws and we have to respect them they are laws and as long as we're here in the realm of cause and effect we must respect them we had in our last series of classes uh, recognizing maya you see was the name of our last series of classes right i hope you haven't forgotten it maya is time is a name form time space and causation well name if you have a name you have to answer for it you think name is maybe one of the least of the five, you see. But no, actually, name is what everyone's after. Name and fame, you see. And also, if you're not after name and fame, you're after trying to keep your good name. And if your good name goes bad, that's the worst thing that can happen to you in your life. Who said that? Kabir. He said the one thing you do not want is have your name defamed. You want to be able to go to death with a good, healthy name. It doesn't have to be famous. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, that, that you're the greatest soul that ever lived. It just has to be, you know, in good standing. So name is, a, is one of the aspects of Maya. You're going to have to answer for a name. <laughs> Probably why Brahman is so good at remaining nameless, you see. He doesn't mm -hmm. have to answer to anything. Well, I'm getting to that. This is my point. Name, and then form. Uh, name and form, Nama Rupa. Well, if you have a form, then you're going to have to suffer it and you're going to have to enjoy it too. See, those are the two, that's the duality, uh, pleasure and pain, or call it uh, good and bad if you want, or joy and sorrow, is one of the most primal of all dualities. It's listed second and third in the five great obstacles to yoga. You've got, you've got uh, uh, avidya, ignorance, and you've got uh, uh, pleasure and pain. See? got this problem of being attached to pleasure and fearing pain. So you're going to have to reduce the first one and, and, and uh, uh, you know, control it, and you're going to have to do away with the second. You're going to have to transcend pain, because it, it gets in the way of your bliss. You know, above pain, pleasure and pain is bliss, and you want to keep that unalloyed and uninterrupted. That's how the scriptures describe it. This is what's bothering you all the time. This is what's keeping you from being at peace, is that your bliss is being interrupted. Now, I need to put it simply. The uh, Hindu religion sometimes gets accused by other religions of being a bliss-oriented religion, you know. It's either they're a bliss-oriented religion, uh, uh, religion, or if you look at the Buddhist part of it, you know, it's too pessimistic. See? So on either side, the bookends of, of Indian religion gets this bad rap, you see. So uh, going to be very important that this bliss, ananda, is connected with non-duality. That is, if you're in a non-dual state beyond maya, name, form, time, space, and causality, and, and you can keep your mind in that peaceful state, nothing can bother you, then, then you're one of those great souls that kama, karma, and yama go looking for, but they're not going to find. That is at the time of your death. There's no karma to pay back. 
my teacher's name was that, Vasheshananda. One of the interpretations of that can be uh, Ashesha residue, Nanda bliss, the bliss of being beyond any residue, karma that can connect, that can collect in a lifetime. You see. So can you keep that pool of karma evaporated day to day? Can you shine the light of the sun on it so that no karma can ever collect? I, I dare you. you see, I challenge you. you see, live in a karmaless, karmaless way. And if karma arises anyway, take care of it that day. So that's how the, the spiritually advanced Vivekananda said, karma comes back to you quicker. That's a good sign. Say, oh, I, why am I always making mistakes? You should be saying, oh, I see I made a mistake. And that's shown up to me today. <laughs> it's not coming two years later, and then I can't figure out where the cause was to it. And so I'm puzzled, you see. Pile more gloom on gloom. So it's good to make these connections. We'll talk about them retreat next week. So name and form. You have a form, you're going to have to enjoy and suffer it. And then time. Time is, is where enough moments, minutes, hours, months, years collect where causes can happen. There can be causes, even unbeknownst to you, maybe from your past lifetimes, are coming around in one of those cycles and resurfacing in this lifetime. And if you're not keeping up your vigil, spiritually speaking, you cannot attenuate that karma in time when it comes back on you. You're not, you're not prepared for the big blow. <laughs> You didn't stock up on water, you know. You didn't realize that you can't flush the toilet when the electricity goes out. Because <laughs> your water pump doesn't work. You see, these are all spiritual significances, you know. You can you can apply them. Uh, you have to be you have to be ready because these karmas are coming back on you because you're embodied, and that's the realm of embodiment. This is where I'm leading again. There's only one thing that's beyond karma, and that's Brahman. Nameless, formless, timeless, spaceless, and beyond cause and effect. Adihi sa sam yoga nimittehetuhu. Parastri kaladakalo pidristaha. Tam visvarupam bhava bhutamidyam. Devam svatitastam upasyapurvam. Meditate on the Lord as thine own self, seated in your heart. Where have you heard that before in a religion? Meditate on the Lord. Where, out in space? Uh, in heaven? No. As thine own self seated in your heart. Who appears to you as the universe. Next line. Mm -hmm. Appearing as the universe. This is an appearance, in other words. Don't get it mixed up. Brahman is nameless, formless, timeless, spaceless, causeless. But the appearance of things in the realm of name and form and time and space and causation is also Brahman. Get that clear, then you're going to be all right. You're going to be able to keep your karmas positive and deal in the right way with nature and with people and as forms of divine reality. So, who appears to you as the universe and who is the ultimate source of all things, all living beings. Um, recognize that one as the primal cause of the relationship between spirit and matter and as the partless divine entity who transcends the three phases of time time is where I was going with that why I brought that slope up it's all coming back in time this one thing we call divine reality, it remains nameless, Adonai, you see, Brahman, Allah, uh, however you want to call it, Spirit, Almighty Father. It's the only thing that's outside the realm of cause and effect, and time and space. It's timeless, spaceless, causeless. And so everything else falling in under that from God's mind on down all suffers and enjoys all experiences these effects of karma and reincarnation and samskaras form samskaras. The gods have a samskara. For what? For dominating over millions of souls. 
They like to have lots of followers, you see, the gods. They like to be worshipped, you see. <laughs> Bring it on. Me, me, me. The spiritual ego. A tree you know, uh, likes to put out seeds. So it puts out millions and millions of itself, potentially. So on every level of, of this divine play, cause and effect is working in some way, even all the way up to the most sattvic cause and effect at the level of Lord Brahma, the creator God, the, the projector of all of this. See, God's mind, we call it sometimes. So everything else falling in that spectrum, you see. So time, space, uh, I'm sorry, name, form, time. We talked about space, because I'm going back on last week's class on Maya, or last month's class on Maya, and bringing it forward, paying it forward into this karmic samskaric arena here. So if we look at space, then you're going to have to have space in order to have objects, in order to bump up against them and feel repercussion, you see. Objects aren't just trees you run into in the dark and cause you a little bump on the head that gives you some pain, but they're also thought objects, you see. You have thought objects in your mind that you're bumping against all the time, and they're causing you to brood or to suffer or to enjoy, which can be even worse sometimes. You get an obsession with some thought. You say, oh, I like that thought. I think I'll hold it for a long time. Meanwhile, life, spiritual potential, all going down the drain while you fixate on this one little tiny thing. See? And then a week later, <laughs> Maya really had me there, you see. I spent a whole week wasted on obsession, you see, with this one thing either bad or good. So space is going to be that which fills, that you're going to fill with objects, and those objects are going to bring you right into the realm of cause and effect, which is number five. So the fifth element of maya that we talked about, you know, as we've also been talking about the pancha process, everything comes in fives. Five senses, five elements, five types of objects, fivefold mind. Now here we have the five aspects of maya. So uh, only thing that's beyond that is Brahman. And that's where your unalloyed, uninterrupted bliss is. If you can keep your mind centered on Brahman all the time, which is in a sloka I just read yesterday <coughs> in the Upanishads. If you can keep your mind on Brahman all the time, then uh, you'll be fine, whether you're in form or not. <coughs> So all of this, then, is, again, uh, a grand preamble to something else that's very grand, and that's this universe of name and form, time and space and causality. If you will, um, before we can start on the dynamics of karma, the colors of karma, that are black, white, black and white and colorless, the four kinds of colors of karma, the phases of karma, past, present, and future, as we just chanted. There's a whole bunch of teachings on karma that you can bring forth that just, we've had here in SRV quite a bit, but um, there's always, as I said that <coughs> today to one person, and she said, oh, that's the subject of the class. Everyone always loves that, but they don't ever seem to quite get it, so we keep bringing it back again. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's a reminder so that we constantly remember that we're in the realm of name and form. <coughs> time, space, and causality as forms. So, um, therefore, we should probably construct a canyon wall of the most massive kind that has the most kickback, the most echo in it. Mm -hmm. And that would be called this Vedic chakra. Now, everything is in a wheel. And this Vedic, grand Vedic wheel is called the Brahma Chakra. And I'll turn this so everyone can yes. see it. And it doesn't have glare on it. And just read the first quote. Some deluded thinkers speak of, speak of nature, others of time, as the force that revolves the grand wheel of life. But all of this is just the glory of God manifested in the world. Remember I told you, if you're a deluded thinker, then you're thinking of nature as being its a force on its own, when it's really all insentient. It has no force other than you behind it. You are meditate upon yourself, on the Lord as yourself. You are the Lord of nature. And all of nature has come out of your mind as projection. 
you fashioned everything, just like an inventor thinks of something and then puts it into the five elements. Uh, you too, before you were born, fashioned your parents and your mind out of concepts, and they had fashioned their lives, and it's all based upon this huge house that Jack built, if you want. And it all goes back to this ultimate cause called the Word. We, we can get to that later. So this is what deluded thinkers think. It's all based on nature or maybe on time, which is one of those aspects of Maya we just talked about. But really, if you're in your right frame of mind, balanced, neutral, non-emotional, uh, even-minded, as Krishna says, full of the wisdom of the Dharma at all times, never falling out, then you think of all of this as just the glory of God manifested in nature. Mm -hmm. So long as the jiva, that's you, the embodied being, imagine separation from Brahman, as long as you think that there's a separation between you and nature or God and mankind, then so long as that's happening, so long do you continue to spin on the cosmic wheel. That's this thing, you see. And it is mighty grand, and it is mighty beautiful, and it is mighty enticing, and it has everything in it, good, bad, and mixed. Mm -hmm. And you will spin there enjoying and suffering experiences. You will gain freedom when you realize your oneness with Brahman. So beyond this whole cosmic wheel, it's a teaching out of the Svetashvatara Upanishad. And when I read it, I was thinking, hmm, people have read the Svetashvatara Upanishad before. I've come up to my students, have you read that Upanishad? It's one of the more contemporary ones, as ancient scriptures go. And Svetashvatara was a, was a kind of luminary who was very much in contact with the modern times of ancient times. Mm -hmm. And um, so he put the Upanishadic teachings, the Vedic teachings, the teachings of the rishis in such a way that it was very appealing to us. Like if I were just to pick a sloka out of my head, thou art the young man, thou art the old man tottering on his staff. You are, you, thou art the green parrot with red eyes. I mean, on like that, it's very poetic uh, because who doesn't in amazement when they see their first parrot, you see. <laughs> Beautiful plumage, those eyes are a weird color. See, and it, oh, it even talks back to me. <laughs> sometimes in not so nice a way, depending on how you teach it. It's, it's actually a very good samskaric package there. See? <laughs> what gets stored in the mind on first hearing. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, out of this Svetashvatara Upanishad, this whole sloka, this is one sloka out of it, this whole thing, very long sloka. So I was thinking as, as it came to me, how am I going to put that into a chart? So I managed that. That really what prompted me to do so and take the work to do so is that people hear and read the scripture and they think, I've read that, and they go away. But if you came to a teacher, here's what he's going to tell you about that one sloka. <laughs> you understand my meaning, is that this word, sentences, m matras, um, um, vocabulary, is full of wisdom and full of implication and and you have to contemplate it just like you have to contemplate death if it shows its face to you and so forth in fact this will be what this is the practice that defeats death that's a quote right out of Rampersad's poem the practice that defeats death would be studying the Dharma but death has no place there it goes away oh they know the truth I can't get them I think I'll retreat so keep that in mind as I take you through this in a wild five or ten minutes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it <coughs> because you can find it on YouTube. As I, I've taken it apart, I think, on YouTube. Or if it's not there, it will be there eventually because we've taken it apart before in our Svet Tashvataru Upanishad study, which lasted two or three years in Portland and San Francisco. Now, <coughs> we think of Brahman as a grand wheel. Of course, this is the conditioned Brahman. This is Brahman with form. <coughs> you, they've already, prior to the sloka, told you that there is God with form and God without form. So this is Brahman, this is called what's called the manifested Brahman. You see. 
God with form, saguna, with attributes. But there's a nirguna without attributes, Brahman too, that is formless and which is your essence. And as we said, is beyond the aspects of Maya. We think of Brahman as a grand wheel propelled by means of a single belt whose every revolution gives rise to two dualities. Every time it goes around this machine, twos are propping up all the time. Pleasure, pain, life, death, good, bad, virtue, vice. In fact, virtue, vice are listed there and there. And under them, the subheadings, happiness and misery, kind of at the basis of anyone's desire to live is pleasure, desire, or seeking experiences in form. You want to have pleasure. And quite often you've left behind a blissful condition to get this pleasure. You see, it's very uh, contradictory. Let's see. If you knew the bliss of your form's nature, then you wouldn't come into form and risk interruption of your happiness with misery. That's it. Yeah, so you're going to have to be a, a very good surfer. There's a couple surfers in the room, mm -hmm. along with myself, you see, here in Hawaii. So you have to, if you're going to go out on those ocean waves, you have to be able to survive. Then you can uh, extract the essence without danger, without risk. But it's a very hard thing to do. So every revolution of this belt, which is here, you see, uh, is giving rise to these sets of dualities. With one feli, in the middle there you see is nature or maya, call it. With triple tires, so it runs along on three wheels. Those are tamas, rajas, and sattva, the three gunas. You know. Inertia, if we want to put it scientifically, inertia, uh, dynamism, and balance. Or if you want to put it psychologically, it's going to be laziness frenetic energy and uh, uh, refined mind, you see, balanced mind. So those three tires it's running along. It has 16 extremities, that is mind, the five senses of, of uh, knowledge, the five senses of action, and the five elements. 24, 25 cosmic principles. They're calling it 16 extremities because they're reducing mind to one. But manas has in it ahamkara, ego, buddhi, intelligence, and chitta, its thoughts, right? So this is an early representation. Uh, you know, so you'll have to look ahead a little bit later to find this 24 cosmic principles. 16 extremities on this machine, on this wheel. Let's keep it all in mind as we go through this. So. There's so many things to it, but you can just, you know, I did my best with some sort of image, but you're going to have to kind of picture the vast and multifarious nature of this wheel of life and death, or good, or, or, or cos cosmic. And when we say cosmic here in, in Hindu philosophy, we're not talking about uh, the cosmos out in space. You see, we're talking about a whole inner cosmos, outer spaces is the outer world, and then there's an inner world, and then there's a causal world that's beyond form. Three kinds of worlds, which is why I just brought this for reference. We'll look at the iceberg a symbol later. But if you want it, mind, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, speaking, feeling, moving, procreating, excreting, along with ether, air, fire, water, and earth. It's basically, it's, it's this machine's, or this wheel's extremities. See? growing off of it, you know, just naturally. And also having their own cycles, right? Water has its cycles. Sometimes it's frozen, sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's vapor. It, you never know what's going to happen. Lava can be ethereal. I mean, fire can be ethereal or it can be liquid as lava. There's all sorts of cycles and phases, not only in time, but in manifestation of each one of these extremities. Remember, so you're in the realm of Maya when you're in the realm of, I already said, there's one feli there, nature, prakriti, or Maya. It has 50 spokes on its, those three tires. <laughs> Five vipuryayas, 28 ashaktis, those are called infirmities. Nine tushtis and eight siddhis. Siddhis are the eightfold occult powers that 
drag everyone back into temptation. Like, like the gods and their domination over souls, that's an occult power. It's called domination. Mahima, I want to be great, you see. Or Ashitva, or Vashayita, or others, you see. There's, I mean, you can say, you know, to uh, make yourself invisible. That, that's an occult power. You don't want to be seen, but you want to see everything else, you see. And so you can get into a lot, to, a lot of mischief being invisible. Just watch the invisible man, you see. Even in the West, they've thought about it, you see. Uh, you can become invisible to the tax collector, for instance, you see, in modern times. Uh, see. Uh, or you want to make yourself beautiful, you see, great and beautiful looking. Well, just look at the cosmetic center industry, you see. <laughs> Trying to help everyone become beautiful, you see. That's a occult power taken to contemporary times, you see. But look at the Maya behind it. Look at the people who buy into it. Look at the money. Look at the vanity of it all. Stand back and take a look at how it all works. And it's just a little tiny aspect of this huge grand wheel. Why well, I am bringing this up in a, car, in a class called Neutralizing Karma and Samskaras is because karma and samskaras happen inside of here. They don't happen in Brahman. They don't happen in the illumined soul. They don't happen in the Atman. They don't happen beyond nature. Krishna says that in the Gita. You must know that all activities and all karmas occur in nature, not in the soul. I mean, he puts it that simply. So soul doesn't mean, uh, you know, with a small s. Mind is, is that soul that goes from heaven to earth to hell. That soul doesn't move. That is soul with a capital S. Atman doesn't move. It's already in everything and all pervasive, so it just stays in witnesses. And that's what Everyone, the Zen Buddhists, the yeah, Advaita Vedantists, and the great meditators, yes, let me be that transcendent. Let me be that free and clear of all causes and effects. Let me just be the witness of everything. Sakshi Bhutam. And that's what I just chanted at the beginning of this class. Om Brahmanandam Parmasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurtum Dvandvaititam Gaganu Sadrisham Tattvama Shadi Laksham Ekam nicham bimalamachalam sarvadi sakshi bhutam. Sarvadi, of everything. May I be the sakshi witness of all phenomena, all bhutas. You see, all of this, may I be its witness. Then I will be fine. See. If I participate, if I become drug into it, I just risk there's danger. And then you, you know, you're going to have to be a great soul, a, a past master to come back to form and stay free of karma and samskara. So this is why I bring this up in the class called Karma and Samskara, because that's all happening inside of here. And if we know the one place where it doesn't happen, maybe we'll start to take refuge there. If we know the one place where that's, none of that's happening, maybe we'll start to develop a little bit of desire, a little bit of flavor, desire for the flavor of formlessness. Maybe we want to be at peace. And peace will be the first step towards transcendence. There was a very illumined soul who wrote me just yesterday from India, a monastic soul, says, yes, Vivekananda was a non-dualist, but I'm a rank dualist, you see. I want to taste sugar, I don't want to be sugar. And until I can be sugar, I'm going to have to meditate and set myself up and prepare myself for that, you see. So we hear Vivekananda say, you know, Thou art that, I'm Atma Brahma, and, you see, and uh, all these beautiful proclamations that he can perfectly epitomize, but we can't follow him there to non duality. People think they can. People are saying, I've had Nirvikalpa Samadhi in their brochures and pass them out. <laughs> if you had Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you wouldn't be spending the time on brochures. You'd be spending your time with Brahman, you see. So you're a fool. And not only that, as my teacher used to say, you're a first class fool. That's what he would call you if you presumed to call yourself a non-dualist. You better even not presume to sell, call yourself a gani yet until you know the Dharma really well. So you're not a gani. You haven't even made bhakta yet. You see, There's rare souls that, that know the Dharma, like Vashishta, the father of Vedanta, and Patanjali, the father of Yoga. You have to 
look into these souls and what they taught and how they brought it together and to have a great appreciation for souls that grand. And they have studied, they have become grand because they have studied <coughs> the grand wheel and found ways to detach from it. If you're going along in a merry riding side of it, you're going to get a little experience, but that experience is like a merry-go-round can make you sick, you see. <laughs> Especially if you've just eaten, or if you're always eating. If you've practiced moderation of appetites, then maybe you can keep a little bit of your balance on that wheel and find a way out. That's what Buddha did, and he had to sit 49 days under a bow tree to find that exit out of the Brahma chakra, which he called Mara, or we call Maya. You see. So 50 spokes, the fallacies, the disabilities, the contentments, which are not good contentments necessarily, and the occult powers, those are the 50 spokes that you don't see going around in those three tires of Rajas, Thomas, and Sattva that are keeping you flummoxed. You see, you might think you're fine. That is sometimes the, the merry-go-round feels great. Ooh, I'll just do this forever. See, maybe I can even get the ring. See, <laughs> but uh, I might fall off. You see, I might get sick and so forth. There was actually a, a true story of my teacher, uh, where you know, one, one going to the World's Fair, you see, and there was a merry-go-round there. And one or two of the swamis said, "We want to go get on that merry-go-round." My Swami Sheshnan said, I spent my whole life getting off the merry-go-rounds. I won't go near it. So the other Swamis told him, well, then you can hold our coats, but come with us. <laughs> you can hold our coats. Isn't that great? The, the Swamis, you know, wear these big overcoats and stuff sometimes, to, especially in the winter. The Swami Sheshnan, you just stand there and hold our coats. We'll get on and have fun. He wouldn't go on it. He's very serious about it. So, anyway, <coughs> shall we go back? It has, it's a grand wheel. It has a single belt prepared in revolution. Every revolution gives rise to sets of twos that all moves along on a triple tire called the three gunas, which have 16 extremities, 50 spokes, and to continue on, 20 counter spokes. Those are support pegs or wedges. That is the Dasandriyas, the Ten Senses, and their Ten Objects. So these have already been listed here, but they bring them back again. Gyanandriyas are your wisdom senses. What are those? Seeing, tasting, touching, hearing, smelling. It's, it's actually kind of beautiful that the Rishis have uh, entitled them that way, is that you should be getting wisdom out of these. That's what they're for. They're not just for enjoying senses. So this same teacher who wouldn't get on the merry-go-round, he used to summate everything by saying, we want freedom from the senses, not freedom to the senses. That's what he used to tell us in class. Freedom from the senses, not freedom to the senses. Freedom to the senses is I want to see all this, I want to eat all this, I want to hear all these nice things. Let's just, the bad things, let's put them away, or things I don't like, you'll just brush them under the carpet, you see. That's that cycle of karma that's building, you see, under the carpet of time, as it were, and it'll come back to you later. You're not taking into account each day this sattva, this balance of mind, which will keep you. And one of these triple tires is, is an instrument, and it's a measure, and it's a key. So you get from sattva to higher sattva out. It's one of the ways out of a, the wheel. Now, when they put this in the Upanishad, it's not necessarily a negative teaching. Uh, this only becomes a teaching of that nature for those who want off the wheel. That is, if you're if you have world weariness, if you're not if you're not in, you know, say if you're not enjoying your food anymore, not just your physical food, what you read is a mental food, your exercise, the energy is a kind of food running through you. If you're not enjoying that anymore, and it's not due to old age, <laughs> let's make that one exception. Then is is it's a good uh, possibility that you have world weariness going on in you, that you're not content, and that you're looking for something higher. Now, there's an aspiration going on in you too. You're seeking something higher. See? Hopefully that happens to you at a younger age, so you have the energy to 
pursue it. Because I do have people coming to me at very old age saying, I think I want to see God now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, what can we do for you here? You see? Let's do a little exercise. <laughs> oh, I overdid it. <laughs> I'm supposed to only do one. <laughs> it happened yesterday, actually, to an older person we know. Overdid it by doing too many leg lifts, you see. Well, this person's only 90. Maybe. So anyway, <clears throat> you know, you, you, it's a good possibility that maybe you, know, you have uh, world weariness collecting in you. Your mind is seeking you know, higher ground, you see. Uh, so that is something here to say about the ten senses and their ten objects. You might have become uh, through with those. You're done with them. Been there, done that. And they don't draw you anymore. And that can be, a, you know, you need to instigate a practice of even mindedness so you don't fall in depression and all that. But maybe de you're too intelligent to be depressed, you see. Because you've always believed in divine reality, so you don't have that problem in the way. A non believer, as it were, no faith in divine reality, that's the worst predicament you can fall into. Mm -hmm. Existence is, all this is Brahman. We've already said that. Even this wheel is all Brahman, it's just Brahman with form. And when Brahman comes into form, there's karma to pay, because this is the field of karma. And Christ says, be at play in the fields of the Lord, you know. Hopes you're, he hopes you're like the little children, right? Be the, right? Like the little children. Along with these counter spokes, there are six sets of eight that go with it. Prakritiastika, Dhyatvastika, Aishvaryastika, Bhavastika, Devastika, and Gunastika, the eight fold nature, the eight body ingredients, the eight psychic powers, the eight mental states, the eight superhuman beings, and the eight virtues of the soul. Hold on to your hats here and I'll just read them down for you. Ether, air, fire, water, earth, mind, intellect, and ego are the eightfold nature. Eternal skin, internal skin, blood, flesh, fat, bone, marrow, semen is the eight body ingredients. And these, according to the father of yoga, can develop infirmities and diseases. Any juice in you, any, any fluid essence can become imbalanced by what you take in or how you think, uh, by heredity, by DNA. There's all sorts of causes and effects already going on in them. And you just hope to high heavens that you can keep your bodily health, you see, with that kind of flow going on inside of your physical form. You see. That's flow. And it can also be dammed up and cause problems. I've got water on the brain, you see. There's too much water around my heart. I heard that three days ago. See. And they sent me to the hospital. Now, the th eight occult powers, invisibility, I mentioned, weightlessness, expansiveness, satisfaction, glorification, that's the cosmetic industry I mentioned, domination, attraction, and enjoyment. Kamavashayita, I want to enjoy everything, I'm going to set it up. And if my enjoyment gets flustered, then I fall into depression. I have no grounds with which to, to right myself. I can't walk away and say, oh, it didn't happen. So let it go. But I'm just so invested in everything uh, that has to do with the ego and its wants, its satisfactions. And if that gets frustrated, ooh, you see, bad news. My mind revolts. My ego, who is the th on the throne, has not been usurped yet by the king called the Atman. And uh, nature is also to pay for, you see. Now, uh, here, uh, the fourth one, bhavastaka, the eight mental states, righteousness, unrighteousness, knowledge, ignorance, renunciation, attachment, and divine powers, and lack of powers. So you call those the eight mental states. Now, 
five, the Devastakas, the great uh, eight deities, Brahma, that's the, the creator god, better to call him the projector, the great mind, God's mind. Prajapati, the teacher of the gods, is a human, but has begot, become so advanced in spiritual teaching that he's the Prajapati of the age. He can teach everyone from the gods on down to the humans, a very singular soul. The devas and devis himself, I said the gods and goddesses have designs on millions of souls, and they're under that influence of Aishvarya, which is coming up, divine powers. But it doesn't mean there are negative souls. The Asuras are more negative than them. There's a whole set of demigods, if we want to borrow a Greek term, under the gods, which are more negative. They have more negative influence. But the gods and goddesses are actually uh, worth reverence, you see, worth bowing to, worth uh, coming to know. You need friends in high places, you see. The Gandharvas, celestial musicians, that play uh, beautiful music for the Devas and Devis. The Yakshas, Rakshasas, Pitris, and Pishachas. Those are Asuras, like I mentioned, and your ancestors, or the Pitris. So those are a, a whole level of divine being. And I was saying last night in our Sacred Arts event at the New Thought Church that these are inside of you. We don't look outside for them, I hope. We don't pray up in the air anymore, I hope. And that's just symbolic, you see. Or unless you're actually praying to the god of air. <laughs> that might work, you see. <laughs> but you, you look for these inside of you. All the deities exist inside of you, inside of the great you, you see, the great I. The ego probably isn't a good place to look for them because it wants to be the only one. But you're going to have to look through the ripe ego, you know, to these great beings that have come amongst us and helped us. Now, finally, the gunastikas, compassion, forbearance, non-jealousy, purity, non-fatigue, freedom from poverty, desire and desirelessness. Those are these eight virtues of soul. Those are worth studying and, and trying to uh, implement inside. You want to gain these and implement them. See, I want to um, have compassion for sufferings of beings. I want to forbear all negativities, all things that come. And positivities too, I should forbear. I want to be non-jealous, anasuya. I want purity, socha. That's a very high attainment. I want to be unfatigued all the time. Uh, so that uh, a man has come from me from a land that never sleeps. Now all my dreams have become radiant meditation. The song my teacher used to sing. So you want to be, let the body sleep where it will, but the mind is always awake. Mind never has to sleep. If it's plugged into what's beyond it, you know, some of these things, then it never has to sleep. It can go to sleep thinking about the ishtam, the body can sleep, and it can be dreaming about the ishtam having visions of the ishtam. Does it sleep when it dreams? No. And the dreams can be very high. The body's back there on the bed, you see. A runner running a race in a dream goes nowhere, you see. But that doesn't mean that, that um, the mind has to sleep. It's, uh, it's ever awake. Now just make it, uh, uh, relegate it to an ever awake state. That's called the yoga of insomnia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always stay, uh, you know, keep thine eyes single, the truth will be there for you. Um, and freedom from poverty and desirelessness. That's a good bookend right there, too. You don't want to be impoverished, but you know you, you want to have no desires for anything, anything except Brahman, except the Lord, except the mother of the universe. So there's a quick run through, it maybe not taken more than 10 minutes, but you can see where karma and samskaras can build. I mean, I could, we could take and study each one of these in a retreat and see where karmas and samskaras uh, appear, how they can appear in each one of these. Especially, of course, in the mind, the samskaras, manas, are going to have their firm lodging. They're going to look at your mind and say, oh, I have an attachment to this, I have an obsession with that, and maybe I have no problem with that, but 
you know, look at the six passions and the eight fetters and which one of those have trapped you and caused a residue to, to stick in the mind. So you've got a problem with lust or anger or greed or envy or jealousy. And uh, then once you see them, you can you know, diffuse them. The class is called Neutralizing Karmas. And I'll be giving you some keys about that. But we first have set the field, okay? Uh, this is inside where everything happens, and sometimes you can even sing things about that. Tula. Tula sita saka ha kara jori Tula sita saka ha sara jori Bhava sagara para utaro ji 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 Utani vinati ragu nantana se Tulsi Das's beautiful offering where he sings about this uh, blissful transcendence. That's why he repeats that line over and over again. Bhava Sagara means the ocean of bliss. May I, uh, the supreme ocean of bliss, para, Bhava Sagara para. May I also be immersed in the ocean of bliss, which is Brahman, all the time, where transitory existence is not experienced. <laughs> so he's got, Tulsi Das has this singular mumukshutam, this desire for transcendental realization, which will take him up and out of all of this. People would think, you know, like, I want to be sugar, uh, I want to eat sugar and not be sugar. They think, well, if I give all this up, there's nothing left. But they haven't experienced the bliss of being sugar yet. They've only experienced the bliss of eating sugar, and that might have been mixed with a lot of sour tastes see, and bland tastes. Some not so exciting. See. So when you get that singular desire for formlessness, which is your true nature, they tell you, and beings like Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa here on our altar and on our wall would be best examples of how to live in your true nature having that samadhi all the time, you see. Can't keep himself out of it. So what's that about? That we're trying to get into it, but he can't keep himself out of it. Mm -hmm. He falls into it if he sees a lion at a zoo, or a man sweeping, you see, or goes to a wax museum. Some of his devotees took him here and there, and they didn't know why he went into samadhi all the time. <laughs> he was in the wax museum, he said, oh, finally, this is an example of what I see all the time. All of this is made of wax, but there's a light inside of it, glowing. You see. So he doesn't see the figures and the forms and the faces, fair or not. He sees the essence in everything, and that's his samadhi. So we take him to a wax museum, get ready for him to check out, you see, and be ready to grab him because he'd fall down. You know, look at that and just go into that non-dual samadhi. Slightest suggestion. This is what's called being open to spiritual suggestion in a very big way. It reminds me of my classical music days where we're playing in orchestras and you come across these conductors of orchestras who have perfect pitch. The orchestra will just drive them crazy because you've got like a hundred people there and they're all playing just a little bit off of perfect pitch all the time, all hundred of them. Nobody is playing exactly the pitch, you see, or very rarely. And when they do, maybe they don't even know it. But that gives the orchestral effect, you see. Mm -hmm. Choir is the same way. We have chorusing effects that duplicate. I was using one last night on this auto harp, you see. It takes the pitch three cents up or three cents down and wavers it, so it makes it sound like a chorus. And that's what you get when you have Mormon tab tabernacle choir singing. You've got a whole bunch of souls up there singing, and they're all singing just a little off pitch. But if you have perfect pitch, it drives you crazy, you see. <laughs> He probably shouldn't be a conductor. He's going like this all the time. See? <laughs> so a little bit like that then, as an analogy, is this samadhi of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, or any great soul who actually 
has found their true nature and you know they've now they know what it's like to be sugar and they they rather prefer it see they'll come back to taste sugar and but they'll only come back as far as the bliss that's unalloyed you see and uninterrupted anything negative happens to them even you know they will get over it immediately like Sharon Krishna once you know fell and broke his arm you see, or his nephew died and he said, oh, I felt like my heart was being wrung like a wet towel. Now I know how people feel. It's a strange thing to say. You know, it's as if this great avatar never really knew what suffering was for himself. So he had to come here and feel it so he could have compassion for us. So it's like, what is compassion? It's not such a great quality. Love is much better than compassion. You feel compassion, you think you're great because you feel compassion? That should be natural, your empathy for people. But you're going to have to suffer first until you have empathy for others suffering. Uh, and then you're going to want out of both compassion and suffering. See? You're not going to want to go around saying, oh, I have compassion for you, poor thing. You, see? you go around and serve. Service is better than compassion. Love is better than service. So. These all form a sort of hierarchy of divine qualities, but sometimes you'll have to remind yourself about uh, what's here. You see, and this is called a videha mukti. They'll come down into one body, live one lifetime, and exit and never come back again. Why is that? See, they just like a comet that just goes by the Earth. You see, when you see it in the distance, you never can see it close up. You see. Well, probably in, we have to remember that there are suffering souls down on this plane of existence. And uh, they're going to have to come down and, and uh, remind themselves because things like pain and misery and compassion are alien to them. They're just already living in a completely perfect, in Brahman, you know, in, in the Almighty Father. And, and uh, that's unalloyed, uninterrupted Ananda. That word in Sanskrit, Ananda. So, take me beyond this uh, ocean of delusion where transitory existence is experienced again and again, he says, to the Bhava Sagara state, to the ocean of bliss. Oh, Ram. He's singing to Ram when he sings this, you see. Um, I think I've made my point as to where karma happens, and hopefully as to where karma doesn't happen, but just drive the final coffin nail into that by looking at this chart real quick. That is the iceberg chart because it puts it in a less potentially confusing way. There's a lot to think about there, but it's also very grand, isn't it? The grand Vedic wheel. You see where everything comes from and it's, everything's provided for. And you can see, you know, the upper echelon, the, especially the extremities. Those people are very much into their minds and bodies. And uh, the rest of this kind of just you know, an amalgam of stuff out there that isn't defined, but you can see how the rishis really concentrated on every element of the creation. They were into origins. Utpati was the Sanskrit word. They wanted to know the cause of the effect, and then they wanted to know whether that cause was the effect of something else. And so that's Utpati. You're seeking origins. You're looking at cause and effects, and this is going to necessarily take you within. The mind is the is the cause of everything out here, is how they finally concluded that. And other beings, whole echelons of beings, including your ancestors, don't know that. They're just going back and forth in a wheel, being born ignorantly, dying in ignorance, finding themselves in a temporary heavenly state, and then being drug out of it, back to their old mantra, wah, wah, wah. They find themselves in another fetus, so uh, these beings that, that uh, are conscious of these apparent movements through the Brahma Chakra, then they're taking stock of all these things and keeping it in memory. Shmriti, memory, is very important in, in uh, Indian philosophy. Memory, especially God's mind, has a fantastic memory, Lord Brahma. Uh, you too have a have a very facile memory, but you have to awaken it to things that happened prior to your birth. That's putting it very succinctly. 
you can't just remember, you know, through photographs and sentimental experiences and all that and go to your death with that heap of garbage, you see. <laughs> it just brings you back with the ancestors again. You have to remember things that happened prior to your birth. And then you have grounds for not only believing in divine reality, but actually coming to know it. So you'll, you'll be a realized soul. You'll begin to march toward that echelon the Tibetan Buddhists have been talking about all this time of a bodhisattva. At one point in your lifetime, you'll say, I'm through with this, and but I'm coming back again to help others. See? Or you'll say, I'm through with this, say goodbye, I'm never coming back again. There's a song, I know, that sings it that way. Have no hope for me, for the world forevermore, I'm gone and gone forever. You see? So uh, there are reasons for this, for each side of those. One's a Videha Mukti, one's a Jiva Mukti. One's a Buddha, one's a Bodhisattva, you see. So basically the one says, oh, I see this is all as illusion. So even if I come back to help others, that's all illusion too. Mm -hmm. They don't need help, they're already the Atman. I think the whole thing is futile, I'm giving up. You see. I'm going back to the unallied bliss I came from, you see. And they can follow when they want to. But these souls, the demon muktis, which we tend to like more because they come help us when we suffer, you see, mm -hmm. they say, well, I think I'll take, you know, mm, let's see, what am I, Dalai Lama? I think I'll take 14 lifetimes and help them, you see. Or maybe I have such omniscience that I'm above the wheel of time, you see, and I see that Tibet isn't going to get saved. That's somebody's pipe dream. So I'm just going to go there and help them as long as they need it, you see. And then when I depart, they'll know where to follow. Can't go back to Tibet anymore. Mm -hmm. I think I'll follow the Buddha, you see. The whole world is unreal. And if the Vedanta puts it in the most cutting way. Other religions, other darshanas in India put it in a little bit more softer way for you, you see. But you've got to get over it. You've got to get over embodiment. You've got to get over nature. You've got to get over death. You've got the illusion of death. You've got to realize the world is not real. And in the 20 years I've been teaching and the, the Swamis that taught me in the 40 years, 30 years prior to that, I've seen the many ways in which they can express that, you see. And all the way up to science. It's finding out that it's just particles you're looking at that are changing at a billionth of a second. If that doesn't sound like shifting sand that Christ talked about, I don't know what does, you see. And yet I'm going to base my life in it my lives in it. Birds have nests, foxes have, have holes, but I don't have any place to lay my head here. Your own Christ said that here, you see, the Christ that the West has adopted. And, and then what are you doing? So this all needs deep inspection and deep contemplation and followed by realization. And, and then, you know, if you realize, do you have to leave? Can't you be here helping others? Can't you share the teachings uh, with those uh, until your your own wheel spins out? You see, stops moving and you're free. As I just chanted, you see, then spend your time contentedly and be free. That's how Shankara put it, and he was a, a monk, an Advaita Vedanta who spent 32 years in the body. He was realized when he was born. He knew all the scriptures by the time he was eight by memory. If you hadn't met a child like this, you would have forgot about the definition of the word prodigy that you thought you, know, you had. That this is not even a genius, this is something else here. You see. It's the Antichrist. You see. <laughs> it would be too far beyond your comprehension to meet somebody like Shankara. And mm -hmm. therefore Vivekananda came back and lived 39 years and showed us in this Kali Yuga what it would be like to be face to face with the Shankara, somebody who had come back with full knowledge himself. So this is why I say memory, very important. Don't discount your memory at all. In fact, account it, account for it, and, and meditate on it, expand it, and you'll begin to see intimations of things in your meditations, which are fully convincing, if you're not already, that you've lived other lives, and that all knowledge lies within you. That's the second of eight great 
eight or nine great yogic rules. All knowledge lies within you. Doesn't it sound like the kingdom of heaven is within you? I mean, don't interpret the word heaven as being some place where your ancestors go, because I hope we've explained to you enough that that's not a very high place to go. You don't even get clothes there. <laughs> so you want to have this divine memory of past existences and bring it all forward into one realized lifetime. Consider whether I want to come back again. And if I do come back again, I want to come back as a bodhisattva or a jivan mukta or a realized soul, see, an aware soul, an illumined soul. Illumined soul, my teacher used to say. I must take these teachings from an illumined soul. <laughs> he would accent that word, sing song manner. Um, in quick reference to this chart, which sort of summates this, basically you can just say there's what's above the water and what's below it. What's above is manifested nature, and it's the tip of the iceberg. It's a very nice way of putting it. What's below is all those things that you can't see, you see, mm -hmm. uh, that are constantly going around in cycles inside of cycles, like a huge timepiece. Sri Ramakrishna went to the museum once. There's this huge in Calcutta. They built this huge clock with, you know, clear plastic around it. You can see all the gears turning. But the the one who had built the clock knew the secret about it. Is that if you were there in one hour of those 300, all those hours of that 365 days a year, that you could see through the clock. All the gears would line up in such a way that you could see through the clock and your friend would be on the other side there, you see. <laughs> so that's what most people who saw that clock didn't know. So it's, it's actually a very good a metaphor for seeing through time, if you're there at the right moment in the right way. See. So this is what most people don't know, what lies below the surface. If they did, they'd have one more obstacle. That was in believing that this was God. It's a big problem. If you get beyond your attachment to physics, physical nature, atoms, molecules, quarks, neutrons, space, you know, physical space, and then you start to see what's inside of you, you begin to mistake this for divine reality. This is really what this talks about, right? I mean, do you see the three gunas above here? Can you, can you pinpoint them? You know, do you see uh, any of these things up here? Or uh, it's very difficult to um, sight them, you see. You can see the brain, you see, but do you see the mind and its deeper implications? You can see your surface thoughts, but do <coughs> you see the, the uh, deeper thoughts? And do you know that the objects were formed by thought back here underneath? in your dream state, in your causal state. So this is, uh, you have to get, going to have to get beyond unmanifested property because it's as insentient as manifested property is. There is no soul here. The soul is something else. So, in a sort of review of all this, but in a much easier way, you can see here's maha, intellect, ego, mind, tan, matra, senses, and elements. These are only shown above because this is an arrow. You see the cycle? They're constantly going under the water, as it were, and coming back to the surface and rising. And they're always in a cycle. But under here, formless matter, all worlds and things and objects in potential are coming out of these. Like, for instance, the elements have come out of your senses. If you had senses, then you'd want to have the elements. If you have a tongue, you're going to want to have water because <laughs> your tongue isn't going to do you much good if you don't have moisture on it. You're not going to be able to taste what to speak of talk. So this is how the, you know, everything follows in the quintuplication process. Fivefold mind, see, five ton matras, five senses, five elements and it burgeons out. And that person who gave us the teaching of fives, this is in the Vata Upanishad. Taitiriya Upanishad. Those, that great sage who gave us the teachings of Pancha, five, 
declared that they were everything came in sets of fives and that each five came out of the last set of fives. See? So this is how the cosmos manifests itself from internal to external. And then what people don't know is there's a reverse chain of cause and effect. Lord Kapila, if we quote him in the Samkhya, that everything marches then back inwards in involution style into into its ultimate cause, which to us is going to be Om, the primal vibration. And all of this is external vibration, far flung from the source. So this little, nice little you know, Brahman, uh, Brahman wheel, you see, like we had over there, uh, is, is, a, is a way of, of kind of uh, slimming it all down. But you can see how the iceberg rests in what? The sky of awareness, the sunlight of non-dual reality. Uh, if you want to borrow sort of metaphorically, paramakasha. That is, there are five, again, akashas, physical, energetical, mental, intellectual, and ego. Those are five different akashas. Bhutakasha, Pranakasha, Manakasha, Gyanakasha, and uh, Chittakasha, and, or if you want to call, and Chiddakasha. So there's a space of objects, there's a space of energy that you can't see, why your eyes see, why your arm moves, why your blood circulates, and so forth. That's energy, you can't see it. And that energy also is inward in dream, isn't it? So it's not just associated with the body, it also has its own realm. That's actually where your ancestors have gone, back into a sort of dream in the pranakasha. Then there's a, there's a you know, manakasha or chittakasha, the space of thoughts. And then there's a space of wisdom. This gets more toward the point of the meaning of your existence. If I can reach the ganakasha, I'm in a space of knowledge then maybe I can find a teacher there who can explain me where I am. You, see? you are here, you see. You are here in your own self. You didn't go anywhere yesterday, and you won't go anywhere after my class, you see. You are here riveted in the Dharma all the time. Keep your mind on Brahman, keep your mind on the teachings, until you can keep your mind on Brahman. Don't ever let it go. See? That's your vigil. And then there's a space of Chiddakasha, which is formless reality. So that's five akashas. So when you talk about paramakasha, you think that's the background of this chart in which this whole marvelous wheel is sitting upon. It's a space beyond space. It holds everything. And what else of interest here? Well, if you want to go deep, deep under the water, but also that's surrounding unmanifested property, you've got Ishvara, the highest form of reality the human mind can comprehend. You've also got the word Om. See, Om there we say, dive deep, O mind, dive deep in the ocean of God's beauty. If you descend to the uppermost, it goes on. I have in my memory, but that's what's on the page. But if you descend to the uppermost depths, there you will find a gem of love. And then continues on that song, go seek, O mind, go seek Vrindavan in your heart. Now there's a space where Krishna dwells, you see. Where Sri Krishna dwells uh, lovingly with his devotees. You see. And then light up, O oh mind, light up wisdom's shining lamp. There's the Gyanakasha. And with its light, uh, light up wisdom's shining lamp. And let it shine uh, eternally within your heart. Who is it that guides this boat of your body across the solid earth? It is your guru, says Kabir. Meditate on his holy feet. Beautiful song by Kabir. There's a Swami in India that just sent us his uh, Kabir translations of all Kabir songs to proof and send back to the Ramakrishna order. So we hope that manuscript goes very well and hope it reaches English. Uh, soon and, and is sent to us here in the West because there are some of us who are very, very interested. Now, there you see pretty much, if you want to call it Paramakasha or you want to call it non-dual reality or you want to call it Parabrahma or 
Purusha, there is the ocean of consciousness that's in which the whole iceberg is sitting, or the sky of awareness in which the whole machine is working. You see. And with this, I hope it will suffice, although there is something else here. All that is perceived by the senses is finite. All that is beyond the senses is infinite. From the infinite, the finite has come. Yet being infinite, only infinite remains. So that chant is a peace chant. Purnamadaha, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamadachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishate, Purna, 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 Purna. It's all full. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the finite, which is empty, has come out of the infinite, which is full. See? So from the infinite, the finite has come, so it must be full too. See? As long as I don't get attached to it and try and glom onto it and keep it, then and, and let it be as it is, then I can consider it full. I can consider it Brahman. I'm eating Brahman. I'm thinking Brahman. I'm walking on Brahman. See? I'm seeing nothing but Brahman. Mm -hmm. They asked Vivekananda that once when he was here, have you seen God? He said, I've <laughs> seen nothing but God ever <laughs> since I was born. And so have you. You too have seen nothing but God since you were born. But I know it, and you don't. <laughs> Basically, you could have said that to the person he was talking to. Because if you're asking, have you seen God, then you must not have seen God yet. You want to find someone who has. Yes, I've seen, and, and flash back to Vivekananda's young life as Narendra, he went and asked the same question of Sri Ramakrishna. First he asked him in and out the bore, and then he asked some other, around Calcutta, he, he went as a young boy. Have you seen God? Have you seen God? Have you? He finally came to Paramahamsa, Ramakrishna, and Sri Ramakrishna said, yes, I see God as clearly as I see you standing before me. So here's a line of uh, God-seers. Seers, mm -hmm. you see. They see reality, not only beyond form, but in and throughout form. So this is what this means. Purnamadaha, Purnamidam, Purna, Purnamadachate. Now here's to end in the two minutes we have left before the break. That quote that I just talked about, everything spilling out and moving in. This is from the uh, scriptures of Samkhya and Lord Kapila. And he says, Samcharaha Prati Samcharaha. It means there is a chain of transition from unmanifested or unevolved, unevolved non-evolved Prakriti and its evolutes to manifested prakriti in all its evolutes, ending in the grossest evolute called earth. See. There is also a reverse transition of elements, see this little thing, ending in dissolution back into unmanifested prakriti. But your soul is not a thing. This is all going on inside of you, and so is this. And this is the precious truth of the Vedanta. Yes, it is all within you. <laughs> now sit, take account of it. And after, we'll talk about those things that cause us to lose track of this precious truth of Vedanta called karma and samskaras. Although there are also good karmas and good samskaras, we're quick to say that too. So here, let's take a break here for the live streaming audience. We'll be having Prasad here. We hope you too are taking Prasad there at the break and blessing it. Because all food taken in knowledge of Brahman turns into nectar inside of your body, but all food taken without blessing it turns into poison, says Lord Vashishta in his great scripture, Yoga Vashishta. So here we will take our break and be back in 15 minutes. Thank you for your kind attentions.
We have returned from our break here in Hawaii, and we welcome back the live streaming audience again to a second half of our first class on a three-class series entitled Neutralizing Karma and Samskaras. In the first half, we looked at two charts that had to do with the Brahma Chakra, it's all its different evolutes, you might say, and, and expressions. And we compared that to, or help, helped um, complemented it with maybe the iceberg, famous iceberg chart that we're getting a lot of miles out of here. It's a Sankhya teaching of Lord Kapila. The tip of the iceberg is what most people, what we would call you know, quantum physics and biology and all the aparavidya happens to fall in that level of of uh, tip of the iceberg and everything that's unknown just doesn't exist to people. That is everything that isn't seen with the senses. But remember we have subtle senses. We use them in dream. We see in a dream, hear in a dream, taste in a dream. Those are called tanmatras and so forth. So we have these um, hidden elements to our being that we're really not taking into consideration and accounting for first and then meditating on and that's the whole premise of an inner life. You move in based on coming to know about tanmatras, your subtle senses and subtle elements rather and subtle senses and the prana um, because you have another space inside of you that you go to and dream and another space entirely when you go into deep sleep and uh, these have been gradated in different ways you know five akashas seven worlds three worlds i mean through the different periods of indian philosophy they put it in different ways and when i showed you that brahma chakra that was a very early vedic way and the rishis came up with um, and uh, as somebody said at the break well that was a bit much but very interesting and it makes sense so you're beginning to account for an inner cosmology not just an outer cosmology and so we set the whole thing up for that because karma is the, you know, let's call it the problem right now. It's bringing us back into embodiment in a state that's not a state that we uh, necessarily desire. Uh, who we're born with, who our parents are, who are, who which souls are attracted to us in life, how our children come to us, how we pass from the body, how we live our lives, the karma that we accrue in our present life, all having a disconnect with anything that happened in, before. It's as if there was nothing before and all of a sudden there's something. It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense, you see. So you can't get something out of nothing. It's one of the t-shirts we like to put out, you see. Or a bumper sticker. You can't get something out of nothing. It just doesn't make sense. So those kinds of charts that we showed, in the teachings in the Upanishads and the Vedas, s state that we really believe that there was something beyond the unseen. There's something beyond name and form and time and space, causality. In fact, the real essence of name, form, time, space, and causality is inner. And since that is the definition for Maya, Maya must mean all those things that we can't see only the effects we see. But, you know, if we burn our hands in a fire and we don't, we learn not to do that anymore, that's cause and effect we can understand. But, um, you know, why we created a hand in the first place and why we didn't know that fire burns <laughs> in the first place, uh, you know, is a disconnect that only uh, spiritually naive would, would suffer. So, certain things if all wisdom exists within you all knowledge is, abides within you that you should have it with you at all times you should bring it forward pay it forward and share it so then comes this problem of after the brahma brahma wheel the brahma chakra has already started to spin and then there's these millions and millions of souls who are experiencing trillions and trillions of karmas from their actions karma is another word for action too not just cause, but act, means to act. And that's why I put this chart up here. It's kind of a fun chart uh, because Sri Ramakrishna has some teachings in the gospel that actually pertain to different levels of karma. Uh, and one of his direct disciples, Swami Abedananda, has put out some of the best books on karma. The Doctrine of Karma, I would, I would say, if you're interested particularly in this topic, 
I, I, I know it's in my library at home, but I think there's probably some here at our SRV library. If not, we can certainly get them from the Ramakrishna order. But Swami Abedananda was named Kali when he was young, uh, served Holy Mother as a boy. So he, he got really good holy company very early on. And uh, then, of course, his brother monk, Swami Vivekananda, and he were very close. And he was one of the first of the Swamis to come that Vivekananda brought over of the direct disciples, 16 of them, when Vivekananda visited the West after 1893. So Abedananda started, manned the New York Center, which is still there to this day, and uh, had his own whole circle of devotees and influences, both in India, where he has centers of his own, and here in uh, the West. So. He says here in a quote, Ordinarily we make ourselves like machines, laboring without cessation until at last we grow weary, discouraged, and unhappy. When, however, we realize that there is within us something which transcends activity, which is unchanging, immovable, and eternally at rest, then we accomplish our daily tasks without discouragement or loss of strength, because we have learned the philosophy of work. So when I came across that nice little quote out of his writings, um, which he probably said in his lectures too in New York and India, then uh, I started, I used that as the name of this chart, Karma Yoga, the philosophy of work. Uh, if we can start thinking of it that way as a yoga, instead of as you know a cause and effect, a kickback, a repercussion, something that is unwanted or something that's negative, and then we can start, as he says, uh, working uh, without loss of strength and without and without discouragement, even in in negativities. There's a beautiful line from a poem actually occurs to my head right now, that my teacher used to say, in front of the altar, and which came from Swami Vivekananda's songs. He said, or his poems. So he wrote, "She who since birth has ever led me on." through paths of trouble to perfection's goal, mother-wise in her own sweet and playful way." <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? She who has always and ever illumined my understanding, she, the mother, she, my all, is my resort. Whether my work overflow with full fruition or with none. So whether the work he does reaches maturity and brings back uh, you know, good returns or not, she's still my resort, you see. So this is his hymn to the Divine Mother, Swami, one of Swamiji's poems. You'll find it in that book, Search for God, a little book of poems that Vivekananda wrote, it's just beautiful. So whether my work overflow with full fruition or not, or none is, is what I'm, the point I'm leading to here. And Swami Abedananda, and all the other Swamis of the Ramakrishna order who came to the West, <laughs> if they didn't know that already, they got taught really good about that because mm. the Westerners were not very open to the Vedanta. And we still aren't 100 and, 100 and so years later, I mean, 1893 to 1993, and then add those years 7 plus 15, you know, so we're closing in on. on that many years in which Vedanta is still an underground river. But Vivekananda said it's got a 900 years rise to it, this Vedantic, this new Vedantic wave. And it's going to have a, you know, a heady period of, of uh, uh, triumph and victory, you see, too, that, that will take place, maybe a thousand years. So we have to, if the West is going to be a part of that, particularly America, since we're Americans, then we really have to learn these dharmic teachings and make sure we're armed to the teeth. You know where that expression came from, right? If you're a pirate swinging from one ship to another, <laughs> after you've come up and you want to get aboard and wreak your havoc, you say, you better be armed with the teeth, knife in the teeth and sword and daggers and everything. So that's what you need to do against maya, against karma, against some scars that are negative particularly armed to the teeth with the dharma so that you can easily destroy them, dissolve them. When they raise their ugly head, because you never know when they might. Never know when death will come, never know when a past lifetime might surface. Perfectly good person, 
one of my own family, for instance. Good to everyone, unselfish, didn't do anything wrong all life, all of a sudden contracts a disease and dies, suffers and dies, you know. So a person without any knowledge of the fact that God has nothing to do with this world, that the karma happens in nature, not in God, understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, if not in knowledge of that, then they're going to blame God for something. And God's going to go, why me? <laughs> well, I always have to take the blame. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with that. You see? So and if, that's, of course, if God spoke, which he doesn't. He's silent, pure, perfect, formless, nameless, timeless, spaceless, deathless, birthless, uh, on and on, you see. We have to keep that God sacrosanct, the formless reality. That's the Brahman beyond the Brahma chakra. That's the Brahman that, in which the iceberg is you know, creating a tip and melting and creating again. All icebergs exist in that water of existence, as it were. So, um, the, the Swamis who came to the West then have to forbear. It's one of the good qualities of the mind that we had here on this chart right before the Brahma Chakra, remember? Forbearance was one of those eight states of mind that you want, good qualities that you want to attain. So they had to forbear and even now, so many decades later, only a few people showing up at Vedanta centers and taking teachings, but they're getting the real thing. Vivekananda used to say, in this day and age, the truth will go out by one person learning it and giving it to a dozen others. And then each one of those dozen will go out and give it to another dozen. You see. So that's the way the underground river flows. That's the way Vedanta grows. And that's what we've been finding even in America here since we've started into SRV over 20 years ago that we haven't even reached two times 12 yet in our own existence, unless you account for SRV National, which started in New York in the 80s under our founder, Lex Hickson. But, uh, so we still have that much experience with the Western aspirant. Actually, what we want to do is hopefully to create more aspirants. Uh, you might get a few students or a few interested people or, or some curious, you know, or someone who wants to try it out and so forth. But as I said at the beginning of the class, you know, uh, if you... Uh, you need to really ground yourself and qualify yourself in these teachings for a while and in order to understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, you see, when you look at the Brahma Chakra. Like when you read the Svetashvatara Upanishad, okay, done. Well, can you comment a little bit on me on Chapter 1, Sloka 6, and what the Brahma Chakra means, you see? And, and after that, there's a mighty river of Brahman analogy that happens just after the uh, that's also a beautiful one. I have a chart on that, in which all the currents and eddies are different forms of Maya. So you, did you get that out of your first reading? Did you get it even out of your fifth reading? Mm -hmm. To try and understand the scriptures and, and get free uh, without the help of the scriptures or a guru is like trying to grow crops at night. Who said that? Lord Vashishta said that in Yoga Vashishta. You're trying to understand the scriptures without the help of a guru, it's like growing, trying to grow crops only at night, you see. So you take a teacher and you get grounded, like I did, like my teacher did, and then you go deep into it. it actually, it becomes a preferred occupation with you, a preferred occupation. It's not like, oh, I better go read that or I have to do my studies anymore. Mm -hmm. see, it's like, I wake up, you see, where's the first teaching, you see? <laughs> I have to, I have to, you know, where's the scripture? Where's my seat? You know, see, where's my asana? Uh, can I sit and take this in? As I do that the first thing in the morning, it's like meditating. Actually, meditation would be good to follow that. You see, read, then meditate. You don't just sit and meditate. Kind of recogitate your dreams and so forth. And it's okay. But why don't you put a positive spin on it? Your dreams might have not been that good. 
-hmm. So your meditation is spent on, you know, maybe you're neutralizing some karma there in the subtle body, you see. Good. You know, but why don't you be armed to the teeth, you see. These truth teachings are the solution for everything. Who said that? Lex Hickson and Bob Kindler. <laughs> Sheikh Noor al, al Jarahi and Babaji Bab Kinder said that we feel like the Dharma is it. That's the where the level we're at in the West. The Dharma is what we're bridging. We're not able to meditate on non-duality. We're not realized souls. America hasn't produced any to speak of. It's be hard put to find one. You see. So what do we, and we have advanced people writing me from India, like yesterday, saying, oh, I don't understand non-duality. This is a monk. You see, he's probably been a monk for lifetimes. He doesn't yet understand non-duality, and you think you can without even taking the Dharma? So where, where do we find ourselves as practitioners in the Dharma? That's why Buddhism has come to the West, to give the Dharma, you see, and why it's getting some... You know, uh, notice. So, so there's some practitioners in it. Same with the Vedanta. Vivekananda made the remark while he was living. Vedanta and Buddhism, same thing. A little different language, a little different period, teaching the same things. It's India. Don't tear India apart, you know, into various things. You can take it apart and look at Sankhya, Yoga, Buddhism, Jainism, Vedanta, you see, and then study them each like facets of a diamond, in the setting of the diamond, you see, in the setting of gold, as it were. But uh, uh, don't pit them against one another. What good is that? Find out where they concur. And find out the, ascent, the essence of each of them. And <clears throat> so then what rails against that is uh, the karmas from past lifetimes, you see, that you You've been a divisive person. You haven't even wanted your family to come together or your friends. What to speak of bringing the darshanas of India together <laughs> when, you, when you can have non-selfishness, as we were talking about earlier this morning. You know, the definition, if you will, of human being equals selfish. So we're all selfish. Self-ish. We're all embodied, so we took on a self. And that self is out for its self, if you, unless you have noticed. And the less selfish in quality a person becomes, the more saint-like they are. See? The more they serve others without, while they forget about themselves, the more they, are, they become uh, enlightened. So to the degree that you can become selfless, to that degree you can become realized. So then we get into the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, you know, diminishing the ego. And this is also what this is about. You can see how work plays into it. Let's look at the hovel of heinous acts. Now these are all dwellings, right? That Sri Ramakrishna mentioned in the gospel. Let's look at them first. The hovel of heinous acts, the shanti, the shanti actually, you should say, the shanti of selfish works. Then there's the domicile of dire duty. Then there's the castle of charitable concerns. Then there's the sanctuary of selfless service. And finally, the abode of action in inaction. These are like plateaus from gross to subtle to causal, from lesser as Vivekananda used to say, from good to better to best, that all have to do with this philosophy of work. Now let's take quotes from Sri Ramakrishna and others by Sri Krishna says about the hovel of heinous acts, the, denom the demonic know not what to do and what to refrain from. Bound by a hundred ties of hope, given over to lust and anger, they strive to secure by unjust means hordes of wealth for sensual enjoyment. This is right out of the Bhagavad Gita, probably not a better sentence that reads the riot act on 
a demonic self selfishness than that. Everything is contained in it and it puts you in mind of some dictators you've heard of recently or you know, uh, in the past and so forth. They just they do not know what to do and what not to do. Let's get an army and let's march it against people and kill them. Karma thrown to the four winds, you see. Just basic goodness thrown to the four winds. Let's be violent. See? Just uh, unfigurable to a good person why anyone would want to do this. Oh, well, you have a little power called power for domination, you know, to make it to such an extreme, you know, become the president of a social club or something. You see, you don't have to go to war. It's not going to make you popular. So, you know, this causes exacerbated karma. Now, when you're talking about something like this, although it's on a very gross and base level, it really is the stuff of cosmic karma, collective karma. This is where we're having problems with all of humanity, all of the ancestors, all of the asuras that were mentioned in this last chart we took, that is, gods and demigods, is this unresolved karma on a collective level. And as it reaches toward the cosmic, you know, the deities there are more sattvic. And so they're, they're not going to play into it, you see. They're, they're going to help you uh, soul by soul to rise out of it. So if you concentrate on the deities, like we we're saying Sri Krishna, or say the author of this statement, Sri Krishna, if you're meditating on Krishna like a Vaishnava should, then Sri Krishna is going to help you up and out of that mass of collective karma, say of the Middle East. It's one of the worst pockets, you see, of exacerbated karma right now. So it looks gross, it looks obvious to us, but really, if you point a finger there, you're pointing it at karma of lifetimes that haven't been resolved yet, mostly by war and violence. There are people with grudges, lifetimes old, that are in this mix. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, look, uh, Ram Prasad has this song when she says, Oh Mother, today in my meditations I caught a glimpse of the universal ocean of suffering. <laughs> and it scared the bejesus out of me, as it were, you see. Who can do anything about that? I mean, here's, in the first half we talked about Bhavasagara. Tulsi Das is saying, Oh, please, Ram, put me in this ocean of <laughs> bliss, you see. Now Ram Prasad in his meditation has his vision of the universal ocean of suffering and gets completely blown away by it you see, and loses all his verve you know, and, and white haired you know in one day mm -hmm. thinking about that so that universal ocean of suffering that some souls must look upon like say Yudhishthira looked upon Arjuna's uh, oldest brother, very dark person, but he had to go through hell on the way to the highest realization. He didn't have to go to two hell, but because of one little white lie he told in his life, because he was so perfect a being, that one little white lie is much, much worse on his record than somebody who's just a little good and has done a whole, lined up a whole line of, of, of bad karmas, you see. Well, he did a little good, the <laughs> gods will say. <laughs> look at this one person who did so much great. Look at that one little spot, you see. <laughs> oh, sorry, you have to go through hell. Mm -hmm. So he had, didn't have to go to hell, he had to go through hell. So that's kind of what I'm pointing towards here. And so you want to meditate on these higher deities. And if, if even Sri Krishna, in all his wisdom, in all his prema bhakti, all his true love, has noted you know, this situation in this kind of level of human being, then it, it deserves mention. Now, let's go on. And, and oh, so here's a little story that you know, there, right in a picture. Sri Ramakrishna tells the story. He says, two men were digging garden and they came upon a rusty old metal chest. They're good friends. As soon as the shovel struck metal, they became enemies. Mm -hmm. 
You know, each one was thinking, that's mine. And so they started fighting, got it out of the ground, and they were pulling at it, fighting. Finally, the thing was so rusty, it pulled apart, and all there was was a bunch of rusty metal in it. Mm -hmm. They looked at each other, uh, looked at themselves, and saw the, the primordial greed, primordial selfishness that was in them, that the friendship had covered, you see, and masked. So that's why uh, I put a story from Sri Ramakrishna next to each one of these when I fashioned this chart for you. The shanty of selfless works. Everyone knows what a shanty is if you've been to impoverished areas where people live in little lean-tos of tin and cardboard and things and becomes your home. You see. So Sri Ramakrishna says, once a man took up residence in an old hut, soon the winds began to shake it. The man remembered that Hanuman was the son of the god of the winds, so he prayed to Hanuman, please save my hut. See, he got attached to this hut right away. It was free, too. Still, the winds did not abate. Next, he remembered that Hanuman was the devotee of Ram, whose younger brother was Lakshmana, and he declared, okay, then this hut isn't mine, it's Lakshmana's. Please save it. <laughs> The winds continued. <laughs> Finally, the man cried out, this is Ram's hut. But the winds blew stronger. As the hut began to, to collapse, the man rushed from the hut with a curse, yelling, this is the devil's own hut. It's a funny story, and you kind of get it. Basically, it's work. Swami Vivekananda said, duty is the midday sun that's burning the very vitals of humanity. Duty. Mm -hmm. Duty is going to be a good thing to a person who needs to learn how to be responsible, right? But once you've learned how to be responsible and you're stuck in this hut of duty to all sorts of ends that's, that are maybe ignoble, like societies sometimes are, people stuck in jobs that you know, working for bad bosses, <laughs> to use a contemporary term. Uh, then you, you realize that um, you know, your higher aims are being frustrated, you see, and you have to move on. So um, it's the devil's own hut work. We must get over it. All work, to contrast Vivekananda's saying that I just said, but another saying he said is, all work is only for gaining knowledge. Once you've gained knowledge, you can be done with works. There's a little bit of that in the West, you see. We call it retirement. <laughs> it's a chance to go on vacation and be lazy and so forth. But no, you see. Uh, you're going to have to uh, have something a little bit uh, more in place than that, you see, for your future, for your retirement. If, if you've gone through karma, if you've created karma through works, then uh, by the time you retire, your mind can't think of anything but all those bad experiences you had with work. Or maybe you're going to obsess with one of those good experiences you had with work, like that award I won. Thinking of my own symphonic career you know, the other day, and the conductors I played with, some of them famous. Where are they now? They're dead. Who remembers them? Hardly anyone. What was their life worth? Almost nothing. My point, and I'm certainly not going to you know, refrain from applying that to my own life, worth almost nothing. See, it works. It doesn't add up to anything in the end. Now, if you have Brahman in front of it, realization of God, then you put a one in front of those zeros and you've got a huge amount at the end of your life. That's Ramakrishna's story about it. But I can't think of any of the conductors or many of the musicians I ever met who ever put Brahman in front of all their experiences. I find they're dying, they're getting old, they're in pain, they're suffering, they're complaining. Their life didn't work out right for them. That's what I hear as a guru. I'm not having anyone call me up or writing me email saying, hey, you know, everything worked out good for me. <laughs> They're all saying, I'm getting sick. I'm dying. My parents are dying. 
I have to be responsible and take care of my parents while they die, and so forth and so on. So that's why, you know, it needs a little bit more of a terse description, this idea about it's the devil's own hut. You don't get stuck in works. If I can pull from the Vivica Judamini with a paraphrase from Shankara, nobody, through, enlightenment is not attained through hundreds and thousands of works, nor through millions of Hatha Yoga postures, nor through hundreds and thousands of breathing exercises. You do not get enlightenment through those things. So, work, work, and work, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> work to breathe, work to sit, and uh, work to make money. But you never just sat motionless, quiet, peaceful, and realized your own true self, which is action in inaction. Anything you did was actually not done. That's action and inaction. You never did a thing. Mother did it all, if you want to put it on her. But that takes a very, uh, you know, very uh, refined understanding too. To say it's mother's will, it's God's will, because you don't want to end up blaming. You see, you're casting responsibility on God or devil for what was your own doing. man accidentally kills a cow in a garden. And he's a Hindu man, so this is not good. <laughs> so he covers it up with leaves so his neighbors won't see it. And he's got this beautiful garden growing. So a man comes over, you see, so, you know, mm -hmm. um, Indra knows about that act. So he takes a human form as a mendicant and he walks into that man's garden. And the man's there. Oh, what a beautiful garden you have. Yes, come in, I'll show you all about it. These are my bananas. I grew them, my own hands. Here's my flowers there, I grew all those. Oh, come look at my vegetable garden. I planted those with my own hands. And then uh, oh, Indra like brushes against the dead carpets of the cow and, Few leaves fly out. Oh, what's that? A dead cow. Uh, what happened? He said, Well, uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> the God of the Hands did that. <laughs> and Indra came out and said, I am the God of the Hands. You cannot blame that on me. So these stories about agency. There are three great problems in our life if you want to really slim it down. Separation is the highest, subtlest, then agency is next, and ownership is third. Those are the three real problems of the ego, of work. I own, this is mine, you know, this is my work, I do it, I, you know, I get all the good things, but I deny all the <laughs> negative results, like this man in the garden, and then uh, this preposterous idea that I'm ever separate from God. That God and mankind can never be separate from one another. Do I need to repeat it? Med meditate on the Lord as thine own self, seated in your heart. Is there anything separate about that? It's in thy own self and it's in thy own heart. See, talking about the divinity within you that's ever one, that is you. So here's the story for this one. This is actually one of the funniest stories that Sri Krishna told. It's about this man who uh, gets up and goes to work. And he arrives at work, and the day before he did a real slovenly job. So the boss is there waiting, and he's waiting there with a shovel to beat him. So he drives him away, running after him with a shovel. So the man runs away. So he says, oh, well, let's see. I think I'll go to the tavern and take a little drink. The, the guy, he arrives there, but then the loan shark is there, and he owes a lot of money from his gambling. So he comes at him, you see, with a shoe, and that's the worst thing you can be beat with in India, because it's ru walked on all this dirty stuff. So a shoe beating is like the worst humiliation you can get. You see. So his loan shark's coming at him with a shoe. 
So he's got the boss chasing him with a shovel, a loan shark with a shoe. Then he goes home, and his wife's found out about him being fired and everything, and she comes out of the door with a broom. It's <laughs> chasing him down the road at the broom. So he has no refuge, you see. Everywhere he goes, he's being driven away and beaten. So this is the shanti, of, the shanti of selfish works. And thank you to the artist, to uh, Durga Maria, uh, who we call her, uh, uh, drew these little things for the book, actually, Ramakrishna story. And don't become, you know, like nowadays, kids get out of school, they go to college, they have to hold two or three jobs in order to pay for the college. So, you know, it's this, in the West, it's gotten really bad. College gets more expensive. Uh, your your expenses for everything go up, and the rate you're being paid goes down. And this gets into the e economics and politics of the matter. But the, in the spiritual sense of the matter, what you don't see happening is Maya has surrounded you, and you're you're doing acts inside of that that are producing karmas, and those karmas are creating some scars in your mind. So four years later, after college as you've been working as a, in a restaurant, busing dishes for all those years, then you've got some scars of a dishwasher in you, you see. And you've got some scars of, of uh, living in an impoverished condition, straightened economical circumstances. And you've got some scars of all the people you met who were also dishwashers and bosses and society and all that. These are impressions in your mind now. And you're going to carry those into your marriage, <laughs> into raising your children. His point exactly. It's a morbid dream you're creating. Where's freedom? Where's divine life? Where's dharmic life? Where's even the good life? <laughs> Any one of those <laughs> are sort of out of reach for you. You're in a life of labor, you're in a life of suffering, you're in a life of bondage. And sometimes you don't even know it. There's a, you know, there's a difference between forbearance and stupidity. I mean, you can <laughs> forbear things, but then you can just put up with stuff, you see. Oh, it's okay, I'll, you know. And at the same time, you're just a co like winding a cocoon around yourself, you see. You're not free. Freedom was your true nature and you've lost it. So, for souls who come to the world, they're fine if they can keep their balance. But if they lose their balance and fall, you know, the karmic bonds are ready to attach themselves. And then some scars come after that. We'll show you some charts on that next week. I've actually got makeup of the samskara and the samskara skanda on paper. So you can see how people develop these certain tendencies in their mind which will predicate their next life. And that plays into present karma, future karma, based on past karma. Because what you did today is already your past karma. When we say past karma, we don't mean last lifetime. I mean, we do mean that, but we also mean that what you did yesterday and last year and since you were a child is also now your past karma, you see. It's called sanchitta. And your present karma is called parabda, and you you have to experience that every day. You see, based on what you did, and what you do today is predicating what's going to happen in your future karma. Future karma doesn't just mean next lifetime; it means from now on. When I walk out of Babaji's class today, you see. And so you've got these three kinds of karmas coming at you all the time, and there's a fourth kind. More good news for you, called. Um, um, kriya mani karma kriya mani kriya gives that idea of sponta spontaneity right? rising spontaneously see? and mani means mind so you've got this karma that's rising out of nowhere that you don't have any connection for it wasn't, doesn't seem to have anything to do with what you did in the past and it doesn't seem to have any place in your present day life we call it nowadays putting out fires. I'm putting out fires. I spend my whole day doing that. <laughs> so I never get around to the purpose of my life, which is, by the way, to realize God. There are other ways of putting that, or realize my divine nature, or to get free. 
And but to speak of that, I, then I can't live that dharmic or divine life. I can never read the Gita. I can never get around to you know, meditating, and, and I can't even, you know, play the piano. <laughs> oh, I wanted to play the piano, but I never did. You see, so everything backwards and forwards, plus in the future, I mean, plus in the present. But so there are those four kinds of karmas: sanchutta, prarabdha, kriyamani, and agami. I'll show you more about those in the, in the week after next. But by the way, good time to mention no class next weekend, no live streaming next weekend because we're on retreat. But the following Sunday, after next Sunday, we will return for two more karma and samskara classes. And I'll show you at that time some of those phases of karma, past, present, future, and so forth. And the colors of karma. We'll look at those charts. So... Uh, but there is good karma in all of this. There is a, a way out. Uh, and that's what the Tibetan Buddhists really, in fact, the Buddhists in general are talking about punya and papa. You might have come across those teachings or Sanskrit terms too. Punya means merit, papa means demerit, if you want to put it there. So you just stop doing papa and keep doing punya. You know. They just put it that simply. Just give up bad works, bad bad thoughts, bad deeds, bad actions, anything negative, and just stay to the positive side. Yes, it's a duality, but you'll find a way out through the through the good side of the duality instead of if you give up the negative. Patanjali has a similar teaching in yoga, klista and aklista vrittis. Klista vrittis are bad thoughts, bad vibrations. You keep them, you see, and they exacerbate, and cause you to do negative acts that you didn't want to do even. I teach in prison, I've told you this before, I teach Vedanta to inmates in prison, and most of them are in there because of their klistarittis. <laughs> things, and some of them, things they didn't even want to do, they were driven to do by impulse, because of lack of control of their mind. They're just like you and I. It's not like the prison movies out of Hollywood. You know? Most of the people in there are just like you and I. And if you go in there, you'll see that. There's some more shady versions of you and I, and there are you know, some lighter versions, and there's some people who shouldn't be there. You just look at them and say, what are you doing in this place? But um, they can say the same thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, let's look at, uh, at um, oh, we just did, so this domicile of dire duty, there's a little story there. You see the woman cooking food over a little brazier, and there's her children around there. Um, and Sri Ramakrishna had another story about, and Holy Mother liked to repeat it. She said, the reason why the female crab doesn't come out of its hole in the sand is because of its progeny. So wealth, offspring, uh, are two of the great bondages called Ishanatrayam. Wealth, offspring, and uh, how do you say, uh, wife, husband, uh, spouse, sorry, spouse. So those three things are in Tantra called the triple bondage. Now it's kind of a, seems like a harsh teaching because a lot of us like to get married, we love our children, and you know, if you can, Learn your, uh, earn your wealth dharmically, then there's really no problem with money. Uh, but that's really not the standpoint we're talking about here. We're talking about it as being a bondage. Not that it is a bondage, but it can become and has become, in many cases, a bondage for people. I mean, even if you look in so-called good marriages, you'll find out that they're bound into certain limitations. And the ideal in India is pativrata. Pativrata means the husband and the wife help each other towards enlightenment. They're two spokes of the same wheel, if you want the, the uh, literal definition of that, pativrata. Two spokes of the same wheel that roll towards Brahman, roll towards realization of Brahman. Now, if your spouse is not doing that for you, see, keeping you from rolling, then you're going to have to consider, do I stop rolling here a while to help him or her? 
I mean, I come across this a lot in my students nowadays. Or do I go on rolling free of him or her? You see, I had a letter just today from a young man. Girlfriend likes me. I know for certain it's not going to last. What do I do? I have to go home and answer that after class. <laughs> just today, young man, not even 20. So, you know, uh, spouse, the Ashana Triam, the triple bondage. Spouse, children, and wealth. Who can, who can, anyone, anywhere, come forward and tell me that those aren't bondages? And how many examples can you show me of them not being bondages? Like Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. <laughs> they didn't have any blood children. They had, they now have five million children. And they're still free. I haven't heard otherwise lately. Mm -hmm. I haven't had any vision saying, well, Ram Krishna coming and saying, well, you know, Babaji, I fell into a little bondage here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me with this problem? Um, that's you. You're the problem. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Let's look at the castle, the castle of charitable concerns. Here's where work gets a little bit what we would call altruistic. Now, Vedanta has a one eyebrow, one eyebrow raised look at altruism. You'll find those teachings in the Gospel of Ramakrishna that, and in Swami Brahmananda's Eternal Companion and other great books of our tradition. Like one story, a man came to Swami Brahmananda and he was going on and on about all the things he was going to do when he got this money businessman. That's why Brahmananda stayed silent for like the whole time this guy went on. Indian man, you know, puffed up. And when that man stopped talking, he said, I'm going to build charitable organizations. I'm going to make a better sewer system for the city. I'm going to construct hospi hospitals. For he went on and on like this. <laughs> That's why Brahmananda's just like... So finally the man stopped for a few breaths, <laughs> which he needed. And so I ran on looked and said, my goodness, what did God do before you were born? <laughs> what did God do before you were born? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, kind of the idea of this altruism. You want to do all these great works. First of all, you think you can do it. Second of all, you don't know the karma that's going to be involved in digging up sewers and constructing hospitals. And how many, I mean, look at it from the Jain standpoint. You just don't get involved in construction and digging. You can't be a Jain and dig. <laughs> you look at a shovel and you go, eh, nah. you see? Because you're gonna kill bugs. You don't kill bugs in Jainism. You think that's a silly teaching? There's karma in killing anything. And mortar and pestle karma, even in cooking your food. They call it mortar and pestle karma. You're walking on things. You're killing things. And, you know, it, in households, a Shana Triam again, in households, it mounts up as backbiting. Why do people get so angry with each other? Why can't they get along? Why are they always fighting? There's these little karmas that are building up for years in families. And they didn't do their practice every day together to annul them. I mean, here we're getting into the neutralizing karma title, you see. How do I neutralize this karma once it's already happened? Well, you're going to have to look at the dynamics of your life and your family. And you're going to have to take to task those things that you know are unacceptable right now. And then look deeper into some of the causes for these things that you can't understand yet that are happening to you. And make those modifications and adjustments that are going to, to help all parties, you see. Now, anyway, so a little bit about altruism, and it's got its definite benefits. We want to see people fed, you know, in, in impoverished countries. We want to see, I mean, what does a Ramakrishna order do when there's a famine or flood or, or anything? They're the first on the scene, especially in India, but other places too, with water filters, with clothing, with food, with masks, you know, whatever is needed in any given place, 
all the money in Ramakrishna order is given to that, and they rush to those places. And the monks and brahmacharis serve these places <coughs> with no, you know, no desire for return. They're not doing it for money. They're not doing it because because uh, they're they're going to get accolades or something. But altruism has those stigmas attached to it quite often. Oh, guess what? We just fed. We sent this amount of food to. I don't hear anyone bragging in the Ramakrishna order about that. Why? Because it was a duty for God to go and help God. That's why. If you talk about duty, that's a bondage. There must be a duty that's also of a higher nature. So your duty as God in human form is to go help God in human form in other places, you see. And that's the number one way of getting rid of selfishness. There's no better way. Karma yoga is it for getting rid of selfishness. You really want to take yourself to task, then go take care of your old mother as she's passing and see what you're made of. So a little bit preamble here about, about charitable concerns. Let's read what Lord Buddha says. Do you do not think lightly of merit? That's that punya we were talking about, saying, it will not come to me. By the constant fall of water drops, a pitcher is filled. Likewise, the wise person accumulating merit, little by little, becomes full of merit. Well, you know, in the past couple of years, I've kind of been using that a lot, the drops in the Dharma bucket teaching. There's a lot of drops that fall outside, you'll never catch, but at least you have a bucket and you're accumulating some. This is the idea of Puni and Papa. You'll get rid of demerit by merit. You'll, you'll water the flowers and not the weeds, is the way Vedanta would put Buddhist teachings. Water the flowers, not the weeds. Just take the water away from that in terms of your thoughts and your actions. If you know that there's a negative act you're about to do, then stop doing it. It's all. Just say no. <laughs> That's your mantra. Otherwise, the camel eats thorny bushes you know, until his gums bleed. And then he comes back as a camel next lifetime because of that desire for more thorny bushes. He's developed a samskara in his camel psyche about eating thorny bushes. So he transmigrates from that camel body to another camel body by choosing two camel parents. Who can tell me this doesn't happen? Don't you see millions of camels out there and millions of cows and millions of horses? And where do they come from? Where do they go? Why do they stay at that one level? And it's the same with humans. Why do we stay at this one level of bondage? Even when we have a desire to get free, why don't we act on it, realize it, and do it now while the, while the getting's good, you see? Are we going to remember? Are we going to have a teaching like this, or a teacher like this, or a dharma like this, or, or a darshana like this, or a philosophy like this, or even a country like this again? Other countries, we couldn't be sitting around like this talking, like Jesus and his, after, his apostles after Jesus passed away. They couldn't meet in the open. They had to meet in secret, their head chopped off or crucified for speaking like this. So freedom, Lord Buddha, the exper expert on that, there you see the man carrying his grandfather or his father and mother maybe, or grandfather and grandmother on his shoulder in that balance. <coughs> and you can see why this uh, merit has to come and so that you can balance life. It's a Taoist teaching. It's found in Zen Buddhism. It's also found in the Hindu Dharma very much accented in the Tao. Now, sanctuary of selfless service is next on our climb here. We're going down, but don't mistake that. We're actually going mm -hmm. up, We're going subtler. Um, a flash of lightning is seen in a window pane, but not in the wooden shutters. That's a Zen koan. If you were to hear that, I, mean, I could go around to each one of you if we weren't being televised right now and we need to stay on point, but I would ask you, what that, what does that mean? A flash of lightning is seen in the window pane, but not in the shutters. That's a beautiful saying. But, you know, how many ways could you think of to interpret that? If you thought about it, you could probably come up with five or six. 
in they might be of not even a spiritual nature it could be you know physics <laughs> or or moral and immoral you know, there's so many ways in which you can interpret this but holy mother says only the pure of mind can see god in others and serve him there in such beings spiritual power gets awakened and liberation is attained so uh, god's grace does not shine in unillumined person they're the shutters see the the window panes are these realized souls and when when a, a flash of lightning comes like an avatar or a great teaching they radiate it see let's be like them see? and transcend our karmas neutralize them attenuate them outright destroy them if we can see? but do something with them not just let them accumulate because the Dharma bucket is what you want accumulating. You don't want rain to go falling in a swamp somewhere nearby. <laughs> you can't do anything about it. That's your unseen karmas, you see. But you've got this ability to do something. That's spiritual life. That's practice. If you've done that, you might as well have said, well, I didn't meditate today. I didn't read the scriptures. And I didn't bow down before my guru's image and offer a flower, but I attenuated a karma. See? You can get to those other things later. And when you do, they'll mean more. Because you won't be plagued by that karma that would have kept you from thinking of your guru when you bowed down to him. You just did it mindlessly. Well, there's the man walking along in balance, neutralized karma, the mendicant, as it were, the monk, the holy man. Now, finally, we get to the abode of action in inaction. Svetashvatara Upanishad has a quote. We just remember that's where the whole Brahma Chakra teaching came from. There are two birds, closely related and very much alike, which perch on the self-same tree. One of them eats ripe fruits, the other, however, refrains from eating any fruits and only watches as a spectator. So that is also occurs in another Upanishad, besides the Svetashvatara Upanishad, but really means these, it's, it's an ancient Vedic teaching that's very, very famous, really, the two birds in the same tree. One is eating fruits, and actually the version of it here, the other version says, the one sitting on the lower branches eats <coughs> ripe and rotten fruits, <laughs> not just ripe fruits. Gets a hold of a rotten one every once in a while and suffers. So both pleasure and pain are on the lower branches of that tree. But the one sitting in the sunshine up there, regal, not eating at all, so you're not participating at all. That's the one who, who knows the secret of action in inaction. The other is just roulette wheel life, you see. It's a gamble. I'll try this fruit. I hope it's right. Try this fruit. Oh, there's a worm in it. See. So that's chancy. See, that's not wise. And therefore, this uh, bird on the lower branch finally looks up after getting a particularly rotten fruit and feeling particularly bad. <laughs> looks up. Oh, he sure looks good up there. He's always balanced and happy. And he always has the sunshine on his back flies up and takes his station next to it. That's the ego giving up its preoccupations and merging with the Atman, your true self. Your self you thought you were giving up and becoming one with your true self. And then you're in the sunshine of Brahman all the time. And you never have a lower bird to consider anymore. So there you see the man and we do this namaste you know it's bringing the two together into one at all times it's really kind of the symbolic meaning of that there you see him sitting perfectly in meditation saluting the divinity both inside and outside as we were saying in the early part of the class next week no live streaming uh, because of our retreat on making crucial spiritual connections. Um, but the following week, class two in neutralizing karma and samskaras, and the following Sunday after that, the, the third and final class in that. Then 
we have a week off and start broadcasting on Saturday and Sunday from San Francisco and from Portland at the SRV ashrams there. That's going to be in February around Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. And uh, you're welcome to tune in and ask your friends to tune in to these classes. Some of them already been edited if they need it and put on YouTube. So you have to look up our SRV website or look on the Advaita Academy website for our classes that have already been rendered. And you may look back on many of these series of classes we've given. Thank you for your kind attentions. We'll end here with a Vedic Upanishadic chant. <coughs> Om Padram, Om Padram, Karnebihi, Srinayama Devaha, Badram Pasyema, Akshabir Yajatraha, Sdirai Rangaish, Dushtuvam Sastanavir, Vyashema Devahitam Yadayu, Swastina Indra Vrida Shravaha, Svasti naha pusha vishvadevaha, Svasti na starksho arishtanemihi, Svasti no brihaspatir dadatu, Om shanti shanti shanti. May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual. May we hear with these ears that which is noble and uplifting. And may we, while worshiping the Lord and Mother of the universe with healthy minds and bodies, live a life which is beneficial to ourselves and to all other beings. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om.